Welcome to lecture eight. In this lecture, we're finally going to address how to make the Maxwell model model real materials. If you recall the past two lectures, the Maxwell model suffers from a few limitations. It predicts the presence of a Newtonian shear viscosity in steady shear, when we know that a lot of real materials are shear thinning. We effectively just have one fitting parameter, that's our relaxation time. And we'll see that in order to fit real materials, we need a spectrum of relaxation times. Because if we think on a molecular level, our relaxation time is governed by typically a polymer chain length. And it's very, very, very unusual to have a system all with identically length or identical molecular weight polymers. We have typically polydispersed systems, systems that have a variety of molecular weights. And therefore, we have a system intrinsically that has a variety of different relaxation times. The third and final problem with the Maxwell model was one of reference frame. When we derived Maxwell initially, we looked at a spring connected in series with a damper and focused entirely on that system. It was in effect a Lagrangian definition of our model. Because stress at current time, stress now, is dependent on the entire deformation history a material has gone through, we need to figure out what happens to an element, a Maxwell element in this case, throughout its entire deformation history. So focusing on it in a Lagrangian reference frame, tracking it in a flow, if you like, is a natural way of doing it. However, a lot of our flow calculations are Eulerian. We look at a fixed point in a flow from a lab reference frame and material comes into that fixed point of view and, and then flows out of it again. And if we use that reference frame, we don't have a means of tracking how the deformation history of what's currently in focus has been in the past. So this lecture we're going to look at relaxing the first two problems. We're going to introduce some strain dependent physics that can model shear thinning in steady shear. We're also going to look at how we make Maxwell model a real material by introducing Maxwell elements in parallel, multi-mode Maxwell we'll call this. We're also going to introduce a rule of thumb that allows us to apply simple Maxwell to some flow scenarios. Now, if you think back to last lecture, what we did was to end up with two integral formulations for Maxwell, both explicit in stress, one written with respect to past strain rate, and one written with respect to past strain. Now, what we can do, and what we're going to start this lecture by doing, is write general forms of those equations, because when we add in additional physics, we can do so in a general form as well as an explicit form. And I'll show you what I mean by that right now. So on the board, on the left hand side, we have stress as a function of time written with respect to strain rate. So that's integral Maxwell with respect to past strain rate. And on the right hand side, we have integral Maxwell with respect to past strain. Now. I'd like you to look at both of those expressions and think what it is that we have in curly brackets in each, highlighted in white with strain rate and blue with strain, and what is highlighted in orange, gamma dot strain rate or gamma strain. If we think about it, what we've done is to separate out a function of the material in the curly brackets from a function of the deformation in orange. So strain rate and strain are deformations. And the curly bracket quantities in white and blue are all about the material. They involve G and lambda, combinations thereof. So what we can do is define a material function within an integral and write it with respect to a deformation. So let's look at the equation with respect to past strain rate. I've now written on the board that a general version involves something called g of t minus t dashed. Now, g of t minus t dashed is an entirely a material property. It's what we're going to call a relaxation modulus. Let's think of our integral Maxwell with respect to past strain. And again, we can write an expression that is entirely material related, m of t minus t dashed, which is something I'm going to call a memory function. Now, 
On the first line on the board, we have that relaxation modulus and that memory function written explicitly for Maxwell. However, when we add in additional physical models to these equations, they will be in addition to the relaxation modulus or the memory function. And so we can have a relaxation modulus or a memory function written from a variety of different phenomenological models that we can use. Now, let's think about our first limitation. Our first limitation is one of reference frame. So we're going to spend all of next lecture formally addressing this. But for now, what we're going to say is the following. Look, if you want to look at a flow, make sure that your deformation rate is a lot smaller than one over your maximum relaxation time. Let's think about what this means physically. It means that whilst we're looking at an element of fluid in our Eulerian reference frame, whilst we're observing something from the lab in a flow, if you like, we're looking at a particular portion of the flow, that flow needs to be going sufficiently slowly to ensure that all the deformation history has relaxed whilst we're observing it. So the polymer relaxes quickly, the slow moves flow slowly, and that whilst a piece of material is in observation, we can apply our simple model to it. So that is one thing that we can do. Now, the formal relaxation of that comes next lecture. Now let's look at our second limitation, one of describing real material response. The way in which we address this problem is to go from a single Maxwell element where we have a spring modulus and a damp viscosity, one relaxation time in effect, through two many in parallel. So we go from single mode Maxwell, one spring and dash pot, to multi-mode Maxwell, many Maxwell elements in parallel. And in a multi-mode Maxwell model, we have a variety of different dash pot viscosities, e to 1, e to 2, e to 3 in this example, and a variety of different spring, spring moduli, g1, g2, and g3 in this example. Now, typically what we use is somewhere between four and eight relaxation modes. And what we have to do when we use multi-mode Maxwell is ensure that we have experimental data that allows us to get this set of modes, this set of viscosities and moduli. Although we're not going to be talking about viscosities per se, we're going to be talking about relaxation times instead, because we can relate those more easily to physically what's going on within our viscoelastic system. So we have many Maxwell elements in parallel, many modes, and we need as many G i's and lambda i's, hooky and spring moduli and relaxation times, as we have modes. And we call this family of spring moduli and relaxation times our relaxation spectrum. And we'll look in a minute how we derive our relaxation spectrum. Now, if we're having many Maxwell elements in parallel, we need to consider how this changes the expressions for stress, the expressions for material parameters such as viscous modulus and elastic modulus. Now, the nice thing about integral Maxwell is that we can easily sum together different stress terms. If we think what's happening when we look at the total stress response of a multi-mode Maxwell model, we're adding together all the stresses in each individual mode to get the final stress. So tau, the stress that we apply to the system, is simply the sum of all the stresses corresponding to all of the individual modes. And since integral Maxwell is written explicitly in terms of stress, we just add up all the integral Maxwell models for each of the single elements. And so stress as a function of time is simply the sum of all the different modes, the sum there in red, which is falling within our material property, within our memory function, times the strain history. And so it's a very, very simple change. Likewise, our material parameters. If we think of our elastic modulus, G prime, remember G prime is elastic because it's got one dash, which denotes it's got the letter starting the modulus name closest to the beginning of the alphabet, E, elastic, is simply the sum of all the individual elastic moduli for each individual element. 
and we get exactly the same result for G double prime, our viscous modulus. It's just simply the sum of all the individual viscous moduli. So, a move from single mode Maxwell to multi mode Maxwell is relatively straightforward. We've got a little more integration to do if we do this manually. If we're implementing this numerically, it's simply a summation loop. Now, the key to using any model is being able to obtain the correct parameters to model a real material. So what we're going to look at now is how we do that. So I'm going to introduce a flow chart. If our ultimate aim is to get a set of GIs and lambda i's, a relaxation spectrum for a real material, we need to be able to do some experiments to yield that and then analyze the experimental data to get a sensible result. So what we're going to do is assume that we have a means of measuring G prime and G double prime experimentally. Now we've seen in a previous lecture on rheometry that if we use a dynamic test, an oscillatory test, we can get the rheometer to measure a phase lag between the applied deformation and the measured torque. And using that information, we can derive elastic modulus and viscous modulus, if you like, as a function of angular frequency, our oscillation rate. So let's assume up front we're able to measure G prime and G double prime experimentally, and you can. It's an experiment called a frequency sweep. When we have those data, what we're going to do is to start off by assuming a set of relaxation spectra. Now, the choice of the set of relax spe relaxation spectra is somewhat arbitrary to start with. If one has a little knowledge, one can say, well, typically for this class of material, we would expect our longest relaxation time to be of order this amount, and our smallest relaxation time to be of order this amount. And I want eight modes, seven modes, six modes. So I'm going to choose logarithmically spaced or linearly spaced relaxation times between the minimum and the maximum relaxation time I'm likely to get. So up front, our choice of relaxation times involves a little experience or trial and error. Now, let's assume we have that experimental data. We're going to measure G prime and G double prime experimentally. Now, the next step is we're going to say, right, OK, for my experimental data set, I actually have n individual data points. OK, so I'm now going to use that in my calculation. The next step, I'm going to guess a set of spring moduli, GI. So I'm choosing a set of lambda i up front with experience. Now I'm guessing a set of GI. It's an initial guess. It's probably not going to be right. Now, what I'm going to do is going to use the expressions that I've just shown you for a multimode Maxwell and calculate what G prime and G double prime are going to be for each of the GIs and lambda i's for a particular frequency. So I'm going to choose that frequency. I'm going to look at the theoretical values of GI, G prime and G double prime, and compare those to the experimentally measured ones. And they're going to be different, but they're going to be different by a certain amount, which I'm going to call an error. And so if I look across the entire frequency range that I've experimentally measured at G prime and G double prime, and calculate the theoretical values of G prime and G double prime according to my chosen set of lambda i's and GI's over that same frequency range, I can then get an idea of the total error in prediction. So is my error zero? Highly unlikely first time around, but I can use the magnitude of that error to decide how I'm going to change my guess of GI. And so using the error information, I'm going to manipulate my set of GIs and then repeat the calculation. And I'm going to go around that loop until I have an acceptably small error. Now, if I don't get an acceptably small error, what this will typically mean is up front, my range of relaxation times are not ideal. And so then I'll need to revisit my choice of lambda i. Let's assume that with the knowledge of the system, we've been able to choose a reasonable set of lambda i. And let's assume that we can go around this little iteration loop a number of times until we have an acceptable error. That then gives us 
a finished relaxation spectrum. So it's an iterative algorithm. It's an algorithm whereby we can use the experimental data and the theoretical result and compare them one against the other. And the magnitude of the error we can use to alter that guessed set of parameters until we get something that performs reasonably well. Now, when we implement this algorithm, we can actually get a very, very good prediction of g prime and g double prime, and of course complex viscosity e to star because it's just a function of g prime and g double prime, and we get very good regression against experimental data. So here on the board what I have are experimental values of g prime and g double prime for a polystyrene melt, the individual data points of the experiments. The lines joining the data points together are not best fit lines, they are the predictions of g prime and g double prime according to the formulae that we introduced a few slides ago. So it's a good fit, which means that we can use this multi-mode Maxwell to accurately capture a real material response in dynamic testing. It's still going to predict a Newtonian viscosity in steady shear, but at least dynamically we can now capture the real material response. So let's recap. We started by saying, look, the integral models with respect to past strain and past strain rate can be generalized. We have the linear viscoelastic model that involves the uh, memory function for models with respect to past strain and the relaxation modulus for models with respect to past strain rate. We briefly talked about the frame of reference limitation and we introduced a rule of thumb that says, look, if your polymers relax quickly and your flow is going slowly, it'll sort of be all right. We're going to formally address this next lecture. We looked at relaxing in the first major limitation, which was one of material properties and being able to model real materials, and that's when we introduce multi-mode Maxwell. We can capture material properties for elastic modulus, viscous modulus, and complex viscosity, but we haven't yet resolved the second problem, which is the prediction of a constant viscosity in steady shear. But that's what we're going to do in the next part of this lecture.